Okay, it's with um, great pleasure that I, I welcome you to our final Terra Web seminar for this term. And before I introduce our esteemed speaker, I just want to make a few comments. Um, I've really enjoyed this seminar series. I hope that those of you have come, well, many of you have come through, and we appreciate your attendance and attention to these important issues. And uh, I think we've had some fabulous seminars, and I think to, last today we'll integrate some of the ideas that have been presented over the, the last three months. Um, I want to also mention that we'll be starting another seminar series in September of 2012, so in another four months we'll be back. Our seminar series will have a slightly different format where we're going to have students and professors uh, speaking in conjunction in sort of integrated talks. So I think it'll be a bit of a different flavor, but equally exciting and interesting. So I want to introduce Les. Uh, Dr. Les Lavkulic is our speaker today. He's going to be talking about, well, the ramblings of a frustrated academic. And Les truly is an academic, even though he grew up in a farm in, in Alberta. He spent his whole life and career in academia. So he got his uh, Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science from U of A um, in the 60s, and then went on <laughs> to get his PhD at Cornell University, and then joined the Faculty of uh, Agriculture in, what year was that, 1966. So he's been around for 30 some odd years. So what a pleasure to have somebody with so much experience and wisdom and is still so active in our academic community. It really is a true gift for all of us. So Les has got many uh, accolades, and I just want to go through a few. First of all, he was my advisor. <laughs> She's still a success. <laughs> for my Bachelor of Forestry, and that was in 1983, and at that point he was the department head of soil science. And he was the department head for 10 years. And he was a very illustrious figure back then, as he still is now. But he really stood out, I think, as one of the best professors over in forestry and science, or soils and agriculture that were joined together in the same building at that time. It was, it was clear that everybody, well, lots of people wanted to go to Les's classes. And it was a really clear choice when I chose him as my bachelor's supervisor. Of course, he was doing much greater things than just supervising students, but I think you know, the core of Les is that he's very passionate about people, and he's very passionate about science, and people are attracted to him, and that's why you're all here too. Um, but the things that he did, like he, he uh, helped found you know, the names of these institutes and managed these, yeah, Resource Management and Environmental Studies, Les founded that. Les was also equally instrumental in founding the Institute for Resources and Environmental Sustainability, or the IR. <laughs> stick next to me, Les. IRES program. It was no surprise then. <laughs> you guys know. Okay. I won't say much more. But. Thank you. <laughs> um, also, it's no surprise that he was the recipient of a university teaching award, and I think you know he could be a lifelong recipient of that. And I think you know he's an outstanding lecturer and speaker. So um, it's with great pleasure today. Oh, and I also want to mention <laughs> <laughs> when we when we implemented when we when we won the Terra Web and Cert Create grant, it was an easy choice for me to go to Les and say, Les, will you please chair the program? And and that's what he's done, and he's been a huge amount of energy and driver of this program. And I think. You know, a lot of our success we owe to Les. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Les Lavkulich, my, my mentor and one of my favorite people, and he's going to be talking about his frustration. <laughs> I'm sure you're all saying, I wish you would have said less. <laughs> way too much. Anyway, thanks very much, Suzanne, and thank you, everybody. Uh, I put that up on the board for a specific reason. Uh, I am honored to be able to serve uh, Tara Webb and uh, the University of British Columbia because <clears throat> to me one of the most important things is science. The second thing is that we can translate that science so that it becomes meaningful. We've made tremendous advances in material well-being because of science, but unfortunately we have not made as tremendous advances in the human quality of life. So hopefully we can help by looking at science, environment, resources, values, and equity, and I am proud to serve. And I hope that at the end of the seminar, 
will be able to see, to say, I see. First of all, a disclaimer, everything that you hear today is my own ideas. Please don't blame anybody in TerraWeb. <laughs> they are all great people. So all of these are my <laughs> ideas. I'm hoping today that we'll do a few things. The first one is I think, I hope that we'll be thinking differently. I think that's one of the most important things is that every day we wake up and we're bombarded with a number of different things and I hope we will think differently. I hope we'll understand that everything is connected, not only the physical world, but the biological world, and of course, we as human beings. We have to understand that Earth and we are energy, and that's all we are. We're nothing more than energy. We're packaged energy, so unfortunately, you might not like it, but we're nothing but a thermodynamic pool. And all we're doing is burning that energy and moving it off into entropy, and that's all we are even though we might think we're more important. We have to take a look what our facts, knowledge, and values, and these are extremely important. That's the basis of science. Louder, thank you. <clears throat> we know that everything changes, and the fact is that what happened yesterday is history. What we have to look forward to is what are ha going to happen tomorrow, and it will be different. And unfortunately, we won't predict. <clears throat> it's important that we debate we're so fortunate that we live where we live, where we have the opportunity to debate, to be able to express our views without having to dodge bullets or without having our heads chopped off as we had in the early history when I was a youngster back in the 12th century. <laughs> also, doing nothing is doing something. When you decide not to do something, you've already decided and it's not worth changing. What are our concerns? Well, we're heading towards this brick wall with our foot on the accelerator and away we're going. And I use accelerator in the automobile because it's energy and it's gasoline. We talk about climate change, land degradation, concern about fresh water, ocean acidification, food contamination, breakdown of democracy, political influence, and it goes on and on and on. Yet, we talk to economists and sociologists and we're doing pretty darn good. We're living longer, we're getting obese, we can, can communicate, we can travel around the world. So the question, are we getting worse? Are things that bad? Or is it the fact that maybe some people are getting all these things and other people aren't? Maybe that's a concern, a moral concern of ethics and equity. Who can we believe? Scientists, soothsayers, religious people, politicians, university professors? Well, we're all cherry pickers, and so am I. We pick and choose what we want. This is a recent comment that I picked up on March 26th. And this is regarding professors in Canada. Did you see smarter people around? I didn't, at least cavemen didn't destroy their planet. That's what professors are good at doing. Number two, a waste of taxpayer money. This further explains the constant barrage of ridiculous crap being spewed by our profs. You might not like it. You might, not say, you might say it's not representative, but it's out there. We have to be sensitive. What's TerraWeb? Well, we can do better. We have science. We can do better. Why aren't we doing better? Because we're talking to our cohorts? Are we only communicating to each other? Are we credible in what we're giving forward? Is it credible? Or is it misinformation? What are the responsibilities of we as scientists and also as citizens? Do we have a responsibility to the public that supports us, to give us air-conditioned offices, fancy equipment, ability to travel around, to do all kinds of things? Don't we have a responsibility to our taxpayers that support us? Communication, are we going to enter dialogue? Dialogue means back and forth, or are we simply going to preach? Arrogance and science. If I don't go to university, obviously I don't know anything. Okay? We've got to get, a, get away from that, and we can do better. And that's why TerraWeb is so fantastic, and that's why I'm so pleased that I can serve. So what's the problem? We don't like to hear a lot of these kinds of things because they're not comfortable. And I'm no different. I don't want to be challenged. I like my rut. It's comfortable. 
What does the World Watch say? Population growth, rising resource use, tilted towards the wealthy, worldwide resource consumption, oils reached an all-time high in 2011, 87.4 million barrels, meat consumption has increased 2.6%, timber has increased by 1.3%, roughly the area of France has disappeared, rising trends can't last forever. But do we result? What are the results of these increasing activities? What is the impact on people? And that's our major concern. What is the impact on people? Why have we arrived there? Well, affluence. Technology has given us affluence, affordable energy. What do we like? Just a list. You don't have to like all of these. You don't mind like none of them. But the population likes these. We like Starbucks and the Bean and Tim Hortons and McDonald's and Nike and Revlon and and SD Lauder and PCs and iPads and smartphones and electric cars and bananas and almonds and chocolates and beer and inst Instabac and green buildings and contact lenses and Bud. Oh, that's Budweiser. <laughs> we don't want oil, gas, natural gas, oil, sands, bitumen, fossil fuels because they give CO2 and they give us climate change. We don't want nuclear either because I did this radiation and cancer and mutations. We want renewables. However, how are we going to build the renewables if we don't have energy to build all the machinery and the fertilizers and the chemicals and, and the infrastructure and the transportation corridors to make the renewables available? I have a problem. We have to use existing energy to be able to move to the next phase. And I'll be talking something about Richard York that I had a conversation with this morning. So that's me. Why are where we are? Renewable energy, reliability of energy. If we look through history, what has been the most reliable form of energy globally? Coal. So it's not surprising that we base our global economy on coal. Report by Kinsey and Company, 2011, says, well, we're going to have 3 billion new people on the face of the earth in 20 years. Okay, they're going to want the same energy we want. We have to raise the capital from 2 trillion to 3 trillion. Okay? This is in observations. Oh, we're starting to get into science, observations. We need to co correct the market failures. We have a number of things. Resilience, safety nets for poor people, equity, deal with change. These are hypotheses. Hey, that might be something to do with science too. We risk acute, risks are acute in the fastest growing markets. Resource capital, constraints, environmental degradation. These are theories. These are explanations as to why things are happening. And then business needs to rethink new resource, uh, new resource shapes, profitability, and so on. So we're now we're coming to conclusions. Sounds like science. A few years ago, in 2000, a few years ago in 2009, updated in 2011, the Stockholm uh, University uh, Resilience Center identified nine tipping points. Climate change, land use, biological diversity, ocean acidification, these kinds of issues that we've heard about in our seminar series so far. Reaction, okay, blogging. I understand that, ap ap I understand that apocalyptic scare stories sell magazines. Well, that's okay. Having been on the research grant merry-go-round myself, the most sure way of keeping those research dollars flowing is by somehow, some way, trying to fix it or relate it to accelerated global warming. And finding that accelerated global warming really isn't a problem is not going to get that flush of money. That's a challenge to academics in terms of their credibility. Right now, the most likely tipping point is that is the one that leads to living in an eco-fascist authoritarian society, blah, 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 a challenge to our democracy. What are our tipping points? Well, our tipping points simply mean that we have a carrying capacity. Well, I'll come back to that in a moment. And we have a demand. So the carrying capacity is a horizontal line, and we have a demand, which is the red line, and it goes up and very quickly exceeds the carrying capacity, and boom, down we go. Mother Earth, Gaia, doesn't care. Mother Earth, Gaia, doesn't care whether human beings are here or not. It'll continue on. 
500 million years ago, there were no humans around as far as we know. Earth was fine. Matter of fact, we owe a lot of gratitude to the Earth 500 million years ago. It gave us all our fossil fuels. The correlation sounds like science. Isn't it interesting how energy use and per capita consumption, or per, per capita population, pardon me, energy use and, and population growth parallel each other? Correlation coefficient, R squared, mm, 0.9. Take a look, human population growth. It took 127 years to go from 1 billion to 2 billion, 47 years to go from 2 billion to 4 billion, and only 36 billion years to go to 8 billion. Wow. Sounds like some sort of a mathematical doubling time. And look at the calories we're consuming and the CO2 that we're spewing out. Every day we spew out 0 0.019 kilograms of carbon, not carbon dioxide. Look how much water we're using on a daily basis. So we're part of the problem. Then, science projection, 2030. We need 175 million to 200 million hectares of additional land to give us 30% in crop production, 30% <laughs> reversing land degradation, uh, decrease urban expansion by 30%, and can we increase production of food, feed, and biofuels by 90% by 2030? Well, that's a good question because I won't be here. <laughs> What's that? Probably every one of you have one of them. It's a computer, okay? 1975, we sold about 0 0.04 million in the, in, in the U.S. and 0 0.05 in the world. In 2015, we sold 122 million and 517 in the world. And, of course, we can see that dollar values have increased. We've seen it's leveling off a bit, but a tremendous amount of computers. Our computers... What do computers have to do with energy and livability? Did I go back? Well, here a laptop consumes 60 watt hours of electricity and uses three times as much to operate it. So every time you send a message out, hits a satellite and comes back and goes somewhere, you're using about you know, a couple of millijoules of, of energy. Well, we don't worry about that, right? We tweak and twag and tweet and whatever you want to do, or you send it off, and somehow that automatically is paid for. Okay? It's magic. When we plug in our cars, our electric cars that we're going to buy now for $150,000, we just plug it into the wall and everything is fine. The embodied energy in a memory chip, one memory chip, exceeds the energy in a laptop. Okay? An average life expectancy of a computer is about three years, 83% energy in production, 17% uh, in operation. The ratio of fossil fuels in normal production, if we're building chairs and, and other kinds of comp uh, manufactured goods, the ratio is about 2 to 1. However, we're building a computer, it's about 12 to 1. Because we have to have ultra clean air, we have to have vacuum systems, we have to go to space to develop some of our chips. We have find rare earths that are very difficult to find, and by definition they are rare. International Panel on Climate Change, you've heard about them. They say that alternative energies, nuclear, wind, and hydro, will displace fossil fuel consumption. However, according to York, and there was a re I've talked to him this morning, as a matter of fact, at the University of Oregon, ignores the complexity of human behavior. Based on some of the studies that he talks about, 130 countries over 50 years, it takes 10 units of electricity produced from non fossil fuel sources to equal one unit produced by fossil fuel. Why? There's no infrastructure. Growth in the nuclear power industry doesn't seem to affect the rate of growth of fossil fuels generated. And that's because we generate supply but not control demand. Energy producing technologies on alternative sources as they are developed has not happened in spite of what people talk about. Demand that generates electricity leads to more energy consumption. More efficient cars, you buy more, more cars, bigger cars. More efficient homes, you buy a bigger home. More efficient co computers, you buy two or three. More efficient television sets, you buy two or three. Okay? Net result, total energy consumption rises with efficiency of technologies. 
York concludes, if we are truly to solve the challenges our environment is facing in the future, we need to consider our own behavior. Projections need to replace 13 tetrawatts of carbon emitting primary energy and generate 26 tetrawatts new carbon free energy in the next 50 years. Equivalent to 40,000 nuclear plants, that means over 50 years we have to build, we have 18,250 days, we need to build two nuclear plants worldwide every day for the next 50 years. And what are we going to build them with? We're going to build them with the fossil fuel energy that we have now because there's no other energy we can use to build it with. It's a vicious circle. Okay. Future energy, here's another interesting quote that uh, Judy sent me not too, uh, not too long ago, a couple of days ago. Here's a retired uh, professor of engineering, a physicist at, at um, Yale. While nuclear reactors make me nervous, the consequences of fossil fuel burning terrify me. These are values. Science is telling us one thing, values is telling us something else. How do we debate? How do we decide? How do we decide in a democracy? Well, maybe we just have to go back and look at the old Levi prophecy. Simply says, well, we're going up this steep hip hill, we're on the top. And as we run out of things and so on, we'll just simply tip over the tipping point and we'll have a blackout and we'll have revolutions and all this kind of stuff. This has been around for a long period of time. It's rather interesting reading. We have exceeded our carrying capacity and once we exceed our carrying capacity, we simply fall over the edge and we have an oil peak or whatever the case may be and maybe that's where we're going. The naysayers and the prophets Prophets say, well, that's where we are. We have riots around the world and so on and so forth. So we're going to revolution. We have uh, all kinds of wars and so on. Well, some of this is based on science. Audrey Meadows in Limits to Growth did the same kind of thing when they did their, their Limits to Growth, the Club of Rome. And there's been an update on that, by the way, if you're interested in reading. And they plot a number of things, indicators, such things as the growth of pollution, the population growth, okay, the natural resource depletion, and so on. And you see, this was done in 1999, and you see up on the top there, it's in the red curve, it says, you are here. Okay, you are here. Whether you believe this or not is immaterial. The issue that comes up is if we're exceeding our carrying capacity, in other words, if we're using more of our resources than are being replenished, and if we're putting out wastes more than the earth can accumulate, let's think of our bank account. You put $100 in your bank account and you take out 105. It's not gonna last very long. However, March 2012, this is a beautiful mountain. It's an inverted mountain, very exciting in France. And the esoter esoterics, 20,000 20, new age believers, I, that moved down on me, so, I'm sorry. <clears throat> they say, well, believe the world's going to come to the end on December 21st, 2012. So why worry? Okay. And we know the science tells us that this mountain, its peak are older than points measured at lower elevations, so therefore it's a tipped mountain, and therefore it's magic. Okay. Extraterrestrials did that. And so we don't have to worry, because two days later, scientists came along and told us that there are 10 billion, okay, 10 billion habitable worlds just in our own Milky Way. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> All we have to do is figure out how to get there with clean energy. <laughs> how do we know? Well, more writing on human evolution, a, a very interesting uh, document if you want to read it. <clears throat> it's talking about the fact that if we ignore science, we are essentially doomed. Science, generally, there's two ways of knowing. One is based on what we call the scientific method. This is doing experiments, observations, recording those observations precisely and carrying them forward and moving towards truth. We'll never get to the ultimate truth because we're only pea-brained humans. We'll never be able to comprehend. At least I will never be able to comprehend. 
And this is what science is. The other one, which is more exciting, is faith, belief. That's where the, the um, doomsday people can simply say, well, we don't have to worry. Something will happen to us and we'll be saved by aliens. This has greater appeal to us, okay? Because we simply say, well, emotion, inspiration, adherence to dogma. And so we say, well, fine, we just believe this. It's good, you can't argue, okay? Very few, but very few, very few human dogmas or questions can be answered by science alone. We have to integrate the two of them. Effects of the ways of knowing, if we have science, we base this on reproducible measurements. If I ask you what is the size of this room, each one of you can measure the room. We're going to end up with different answers, but each one is going to be correct based on the way you did your measurement. And that's reproducible. If I do it by a meter stick, you do it by a meter stick, everybody else does it by a meter stick, we're going to come up with the same dimension, plus or minus. Okay? Now if I say, I believe this room is too small. First place we can debate, right? And say, well, look, you can't, you can't measure the room with a meter stick because it's not rectangular and it's not square and it's got round corners, so therefore you can't do it. And we get into big debates and arguments and we'll talk about fractals and integration over time and space and so on. I bring out my lasers and all kinds of things. But if I just simply say, well, you can, this room is too small, I believe the room is too small. Where's the argument? Now, usually science and religion are separated, but I thought this was rather interesting. By the way, I'm not a Buddhist. I wish I was. Essentially, the Dalai Lama says if science proves some belief of Buddhism is wrong, then Buddhism has to change. I thought that was quite revealing. Usually, it's the other way around. If I believe something, science has to change. By learning from science about aspects of reality, I believe that Buddhism enriches its own world. He's a marvelous guy. I had the opportunity to visit, uh, shake his hand. I was very, very impressed. What is science? Well, first of all, it's not democratic. We don't vote on aspects of science. We make measurements. We may not like it. It is a consensus by peers. So we talk to each other and we all agree. Somebody challenges from the outside and then we get defensive. It's a human activity and therefore it's fraught with all the activities that are are the result of our little pea brains in it, able to think. It's always moving forward or backward or moving anyway because we have to have a standard. So it's based on previous knowledge and our standards and so on. It's very informative. However, it does not dictate human values nor necessarily our actions. It does give us material well-being but in my estimation, and remember, all these opinions are mine, I think we've lost spirituality, the connection between us amongst ourselves and to our earth. What is Western science? Well, most of it's based on Greek philosophy, Aristotle, search, search for truth. <clears throat> An Arab brought that to the Western world, a believer in Aristotle, <clears throat> and he brought to us our modern way of doing science. And this was introduced to Europe in the 12th century. And that is the basis for what we call our scientific method. Please, don't confuse the scientific method with the experimental method that Bacon and Popper talk about. What's the method? Observation, statement of a problem, formation, formation of hypotheses, test the hypotheses, analyze your tests, interpret the data, form a conclusion, and communicate. That's what science is. And you don't stop after one, two, four, six, or nine. There's no nine. You don't stop there anyway. We have three categories that form the basis of communication. Hypotheses. We have lots of those. These are general statements. General statements from guesses about what's going on. Okay, so these are guesses. Well, you know, I think, blah, blah, blah. So then I'll say, well, if I think so and so, I'm going to come back to this in a moment, I can make a theory about what's going on. Okay? So we've got a lot of hypotheses. 
lots of theories and a few laws. Laws are the ones that we can really say something about, and those won't change. So the progression from hypothesis to theory to law represents an increasing confidence in the explanation of our understanding of nature. We have to be very careful when we interpret science to make sure that we understand, is it a hypothesis that we're interpreting, a theory that we're interpreting, or is it a law? And we have to keep in mind that as we go from observations down to hypotheses, to theory, to conclusions, we're using our little pea brains, and our little pea brains are not perfect. They don't have all the information. They're based on our previous information that we've collated and understood, and people have told us about it. So it's a human activity. It's not magic. The aliens are not helping us, I don't think. <coughs> Data, by one step of human reasoning, is transformed into information. We talk about the information era. I don't think we're in the information era. We're in the data era. We have data coming out of, you know, whatever the places you want to talk about. We don't have very much information. We get information, and we look at that data, and we put that information, we get this magic thing called a paradigm. I'll never forget when I was first introduced to paradigms. I was coming out of a movie, house, a movie theater one evening, and this young couple said, boy, that movie sure changed my paradigm. And I was wondering if I could buy one. <laughs> a paradigm does not mean truth. It's information based on our values. Through human reasoning, communication, information can be converted to knowledge. Knowledge comes from the analysis of science and our values, our experience, and our ethics. Is science objective? Well, I wonder. We have great debates among scholars and politicians and citizenry and so on. Particularly when the same science is used to defend contrasting events as a result of our values. The climate gate incident comes to mind immediately. You take the same science. I have a book on my shelf that says, the and then a little thing in red, true meaning. Okay? It takes the same data. I used to do this when I, I used to give it to my class when I was active teaching. I used to give them my class, give them the data, have them interpret it in one way, and then give them the same data, have them interpret it in another way. Same data, totally different conclusions. Okay. Not all groups or even scientists agree about the cause and effects of climate change, even if they all agree that it's a reality. Most people agree that it's climate change. Is it human-induced? Science to policy. Let me give you an example. Doubling time calculates the number of years it takes to a population to double in size given a certain growth rate per year. So I can come up with science. This is for my quantitative friends. And the number of years <coughs> for to double is the natural log of 2 divided by the natural log multiplied by 1 plus r over 100. Approximately n is equal to 70. So that means that if I know what the rate of interest is, or the rate of return is, or the rate of double, whatever I'm interested in, population grows at 10%, in seven years it's going to double. That's science. Okay? You can try your best to try to disprove that, and you're going to have a heck of a hard time doing it, because it's based on laws of science. You can't change that. So you say, well, deduction is theory. Population will double in seven years, if it's 10% per year. So then you come up with hypotheses, and you say, well, I agree with that, but I don't think so. Okay, that's opinion, and that's interpretation, and that's values, because you say, because even though it'll double in X number of years, what we're going to have is all of a sudden we're going to have a famine, or we're going to have no water, or we're going to have introduced birth control, or we're going to have a, a war or something like this, and we're going to find it's, it's less. And so I make a prediction and say, look it, at the present rate of growth of 10%, we're going to double the population in seven years, and seven years comes by, and I, lo and behold, it's increased by 15% or by 3%, so therefore, as a scientist, I'm wrong. Correct? And approximately 70 is not wrong. My interpretation is wrong. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind. 
Now we can put that into policy, okay, and say, well, I agree, but I think debate, that's great. We can debate these kinds of things. We can come up with all kinds of ideas. And then we say, well, look, at we got to really, the real debate here is, is it pro-life or pro-choice? Uh, pro oh, but I want to sell more computers. This is fantastic, okay? I'm going to gear up my system so I can sell, you know, more, double the amount of computers in seven years. Or I can say, gee, for screepers, you know, we're already running out of water. Where are we going to get the rest of the water from? Same science, different interpretations, different policy. We're going to buy electric cars in British Columbia starting at $50,000 to $150,000 so that we can decrease our carbon footprint. But we're going to power it by electricity. And electricity comes from there. And we don't want Site C. We don't want oil. We don't want natural gas. We don't want run of the river. We don't want coal. I'm frustrated. <laughs> Everything's connected. This is something that we talk, heard about the other day from Tony Farrell. Carbon dioxide in the air, science tells us that it can be assimilated in the ocean. In fact, carbon dioxide is, is introduced in the atmosphere, but it has to be moved into the ocean. Okay, so we have a theory, and then we have a fact. It has to move in there. Okay, well, what we find out is acidification, but it's not the ocean that's being acidified. It's a little mixed layer at the surface because if the CO2 will react in the surface very quickly, a couple of years, but it takes a molecule of carbon dioxide a thousand years. It's very slow in migrating. Okay, so rates of reactions are important. Same science, different conclusion. Okay? The uppermost layer will ch change, no question. And yes, we can rant and rave. Coral reefs are going, blah, blah, blah. Oceans are acidifying. But not all oceans are acidifying. I'm not saying that it's not important and we want coral reefs and we want all those kind of things by all means. But be careful if you're going to maintain your credibility. Ocean circulation. Cold water sinks at the poles, comes up, moves around. Well, what happens if the cold water isn't as cold? It's not going to move as deep and it's not going to come back. Ocean currents are going to be <coughs> changed. And Tony Farrell is right. It's, the land is connected to the ocean. And if we don't know what's going on in the ocean, we better not be able to predict what's happening, happening on the land. It's connected. We can't have our little pigeonholes and just simply say, we're looking at the land, we're looking at the ocean, we're looking at the top 10 centimeters or what have you. We have to look at these kinds of things and debate will allow us that because I can't comprehend any one of these things, but collectively we can. And I think that's where TerraWeb comes in. Water needs energy, water, nexus. I was asked this morning by an esteemed cohort of mine, Julia Dodder, what is my big, big major concern? And I said, my major concern has been for quite a long time and it still is my major concern. The nexus between energy, water, and food. That's my biggest concern. Because even if we stop breathing right now and use no more fossil fuels, the CO2 in the atmosphere is going to continue for X number of years. But if we don't have food to eat next week, we're in trouble. If we have no water to drink in two months, we're in trouble. It's when, what is that time frame? We have to, and they're connected. Here's virtual water. Something that a lot of people, and I heard somebody say, well, I don't believe in virtual water. I don't care what you believe in. The science tells us that if we drink coffee, one kilogram of coffee takes, a, um, one kilogram of coffee takes, I can't read it from here, 20,000 liters to produce. So let's go to the bean and have a coffee. Okay? Well, no, I don't drink coffee. You know, I, I only drink milk. 2,000 liters. Okay. <coughs> So that means you can have more people at a, at a milk party than you can have at a coffee party. <laughs> Does that give us a new tipping point? Well, maybe we should be thinking about this. The World Energy Council and the Food uh, Water Council joined forces in 2011 
And a recent report came out. It's, it's about a 700-page report. If anybody wants to read it, I have a copy talking about the future of energy. Indicates that, you know, we've got to be worried about this because this, this can happen right now. By right now, I mean within the next five to ten years. It's a finite Earth. Thermodynamics, I know you don't like thermodynamics. But we don't lose anything from this Earth except possibly hydrogen and helium. All we do is redistribute things. I used to say this in my classes that if I, if I was really clever, what I would do is I would stake out every cemetery in the world and mine it. Because that's where all the jewels and the gold teeth and stuff have been buried. <laughs> they collected it from around the world and they concentrated it for me in the cemetery. We don't use any of this stuff, we just redistribute it. That's all we're doing. And as we redistribute it, we make a lot of things that were once useful, useless. It's called entropy. So there's no way that you can do something without having an impact. Useful energy, if you want, <clears throat> the free energy, delta G or delta F, depending on what uh, school you uh, believe in, is available the available energy, the enthalpy, minus the lost energy, which is the entropy. And it's this what defines our carrying capacity. Let's look at net energy. What is the net energy, the total energy that can be used for purposes other than creating more energy? I've already talked about that. We can't create new energy without using existing energy. So what's the new energy? Why have we been so lucky? Because we've had cheap energy. I don't care whether those numbers are correct or not. The trend is correct. Okay? The, the numbers don't matter. The trend is correct. We're going to be at the far right-hand side if we're going to be spending money, not at the far, far left-hand side, not at the far right-hand side. What about the energy sources? We talk a lot about carbon. How many of you have heard of the importance of the carbon to hydrogen ratio? That's what's important in energy. We, what is electricity? Electricity are electrons. Go to the hydrogen economy, it's protons. I think that protons and electrons have to add up together to get zero. Oh, that's what I used to think. OK, so it's what we're interested in is to get that ratio as wide as possible so we get a lot of hydrogen for very little carbon. Maybe methane is not a bad idea. Okay? These are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about. <clears throat> Let's go to another area of, of scholarly activity, archaeology. Lynn White said that what's important is the energy return on energy invested. Not a bad idea. She looked at primitive societies and said that the ratio was about five to one. Okay, you did five energy and you got one. So let's take ten to one, hunter-gatherer. Okay, so this means that once I exceeded ten to one, then any energy I get above that I can do for other purposes. I can use for cultural purposes, I can run around, I can go, you know, instead of chasing saber-toothed tigers, I can now chase dinosaurs, whatever you want. I, I, I don't know my time frame, you know, I don't think they existed together, but I was, I was quite young in those days, so I'll give you a break. Energy return on energy invested. The ratio of the amount of usable energy, that's delta, and that's free energy, acquired from a particular energy source to the amount of energy expended. Not to be confused with efficiency. Here's, a, here's one that is not, I shouldn't have used this, right, Julia? This is not copyright. This is copyrighted and it's wrong. It's all kinds of things. Oil, way up there. Narrow range, look at the bottom, wide range. Are you surprised that we use oil, oil shales, tar sands, rather than hydropower or geothermal? If we have to put more energy to get the energy out, that doesn't make much sense. Not to mention the true cost. It's not only aerial that's important, it's what is the cost of carbon dioxide spewing into our atmosphere? What's the cost of toxic chemicals leaking into our air, into our water systems? What's the cost to public health? What's the cost of each oil war that we have? What is the cost of funding petrodictatorships? 
and what's the cost of doing nothing? These are our debates. And we have to look at these debates from a scientific point of view and then also from our point of view <coughs> as to what we think are important and what are our values. I pulled a trick on a number of people because I've often asked the question, what's the main greenhouse gas? The media tells us it's carbon dioxide. Wrong. Water vapor. We don't like that because we can't do anything about water vapor. And I've had people tell me, the nice thing about the hybrid car and the fuel cell is that there's no pollution. The only thing that comes out the end is water. I have difficulty with that. But then, of course, I'm not too bright. The other issue that comes up is that science has difficulty distinguishing between water vapor and some forms of carbon dioxide. So when we measure it with infrared spectroscopy, we're not even sure if we're measuring hydro water, hydrous oxide, or carbon dioxide. There's error. And so we base it on models. Well, you can believe in models. Here are the common greenhouse gases. You notice the little green part this is the kind of thing, if you're a denialist, you'll use this until you're dead to show, <laughs> look it. We're not contributing very much. But that's like several years ago, I read an article in Science that said, well, the United States can kill everybody on the face of the Earth 17 times, but the USSR can kill everybody on the Earth 1,700 times. And I said, I thought once was enough. <laughs> this is the kind of thing you see in the, in the press. Have you ever heard Al Gore or Obama talk about carbon uh, water? I don't think so, because they're in bed with the large corporations. Water vapor absorbs infrared. I've mentioned that. Urbanization. We're putting everybody into an urban center. We don't, we, we don't assimilate any of the carbon, we just produce it. And then we compost in the city to make sure that we add even more CO2 in the city instead of composting out in the countryside. I don't care. It's up to you. We can make those decisions. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Roughly 71% of global energy develops CO2. 1.8% uh, increase in the cities, 1.8% per year. By 2030, if we continue what we're doing, 55% increase or twice the amount of emissions in the United States. I don't know if you've been seeing iPad on some of these slides as we were going through. What is it? Well, son of a gun. Paul Ehrlich said, impact on the environment is a result of population growth, affluence, number of computers we have, the technology, efficiency, or do we make it less efficient? Well, what can we affect? Population, uh, got to be careful there, pro-life, pro-choice. Uh, affluence, yes. I'm all for that. T, technology. Well, these are all by, done by corporations. So here's Tony Farrell's idea. What you do is, we've evolved. We'll stop. We'll put a wall. No more evolution. Everybody in the third world, stop. Leave us alone. Okay. Are we equitable? Here's the price of water <coughs> in New York versus in Colombia. Is that equitable? Are we more privileged? We put up the wall. We want cheap water, but the people in Ecuador or in Colombia, they can afford to pay it. Carbon tax. Fantastic. We put it in 2008. In 2008, sold 4,529,000 cubic meters of gasoline. We put in the carbon tax, and we decreased it to 4,006. No, that's not a decrease. Oh. I seem to think that more gas, burning more gas, means more CO2. That's what science tells me. But I guess I'm wrong. However, we'll give it all back to you. If you make less than $31,000 a year, we'll give, you uh, we'll give you $115. Public support, yeah, that's what we want. North America, you betcha. Liberal government wanted to put it in their platform, got defeated. Why? Penalizes the middle and lower income people. Pemina Institute said, well, if we used it for doing such a public transit, it may be useful. But we're using it for other things. 
So don't tell me, I'm a skeptic, that it's not a tax grab. We're not using it for public transport. We're using it for general revenue. Am I going to believe that? Here, carbon tax. <laughs> I make $10 an hour, Hans Schreier makes $50, 000, $50 an hour. <laughs> I pay 0.6% of my income for gasoline. He only spends 0.12%. So I earn one-fifth less, but I pay 100% more. He thinks it's equitable. I don't. <laughs> Carbon tax, is it a regressive tax? Well, there are certain people that seem to think it's regressive. Okay, these have been coming out recently, increasingly. Okay, limits the carbon emission by carbon tax, but who does it hit? It hits the poorest people. They pay the greater share, from 1.4 to four times as much as the wealthy people. Is that equitable? To me, no. But you can have your own values. Then we wonder, what the heck kind of curve is that? We see that it's going down in terms of the amount of income rate in Canada. This is a fact. And then we say, well, holy mackerel, if I follow the Harper government, I'm going to be on the green line. And uh, but my God, look at uh, the yellow line. And they, they're not increasing at the same rate. And I can do a calculation and find out that, 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 that the delta dollars versus delta time, there's a disparity. So you wonder, are the wealthy getting wealthier? But the carbon, ta carbon tax is giving everybody $115. So maybe we should be looking at environmental policy with full cost pricing. The kind of thing that Olliweiler at, you know, at uh, Simon Fraser has been doing for a number of years, working with the Public Policy Institute. Recent article, two, 2012, says higher efficiency vehicles may actually raise total consumption, called the rebound effect. Vehicles lower the marginal cost of driving and lead to more kilometers traveled. The human element has been taken out of the science. We forget to put in human values when we do the carbon tax. The fact is that we're going to have a thousand plug-in stations for electric cars in the province of British Columbia that are going to be free. If you plug your car in, it's free. And if you buy an electric car, the government's going to give you $5,000 to buy a $50,000 to $220,000 car. All of us should run out and buy one. Revenue neutral? No, it's not revenue neutral. Why should we be giving governments money so they can give it back to us? That's a useless transaction. And here we argue about the value of the PST, GST versus the HST, and we're doing the same thing. We're trusting government to take our money and give it back to us. Well, I, my values, not science, I don't trust politicians. I like Homer Dixon, a favorite author of mine, said, look at, from the far left-hand side, okay? Decrease renewable resources, I think we started off with that. Population, it's, that was part of the equation. When we come along, increased resource scarcity, when people can migrate, well, that was great, you know. <clears throat> In the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s, when I didn't like where I was living, I went to another continent. We discovered North America, and whoa, Australia, wow. Well, we don't have any more. Oh, that's okay, there's 10 billion planets in there. <laughs> so what happens? Ethnic conflict, coup d'etat. He wrote that over uh, in 1994. I'm not an economist, and Tony Farrell laughs at me when I plotted this one. This is, you're all seeing the supply and demand curve, right? That are familiar? Okay, what does the economist say? Supply and demand, well, if you have supply, the price will, if you have lots of supply, the price will go down, the demand will drive it up, fine, right? Now let's take it to the far left-hand side, and let's go up that supply curve. What happens to the value when the supply goes to zero? What's the value? So what happens if I have no food? Can I buy it? There's nothing to buy. If I don't have a water, a glass of water, there's nothing to buy. I can't, it doesn't matter if I give billions of dollars for a pint of water, there ain't any to buy. 
Economists never show you this. They assume 100% substitutability. If you don't have water, that's okay. You can drink kerosene or, I don't know. <laughs> I know, booze, that's it, bud. Okay, this is thanks to uh, Gladys. The top curve shows the rate of exploitation of a resource, we'll call it A, and so it's a normal distribution. At point one, we have an inflection point. There's a change in the rate, okay? We go from growth to de decrease. And then at two is a tipping point, and we collapse, right? Is that okay? Number two, same one, but now we have a little yellow line, the bottom solid line, same area under A1 and A2, same number of area. And so rather than having a sharp curve, oh, I can use this fancy thing that Julie gave me. Okay, there is the same curve there, and the same area of the curve, and I'm shaking there. Okay, well, if I take and I decrease my rate, I can extend the time. So if I have $100 in the bank, and if I take out $50 at a time, I'm not going to have very much money for a very long period of time. But if I take it out at a dollar at a time, I'm going to have quite a, long, quite a lot of money. So maybe we should decrease our needs, decrease our consumption. And then we might have more resources. And look, if we add those two together, we actually don't have to take a decrease. Because at that inflection point, we've already started adding before we reach that, at that inflection point, we've already started to look at an alternative supply. And look, well, we can, ooh, that's hard to look at. Sorry about that. What we can do is we can have a whole pile of these, and every time we have an inflection point, let's put some effort into developing a new source. So if we start off with using coal and we start, we have an inflection point, we're heading out for a collapse, let's in, bring something else in. Let's bring something else in so that we continue that time frame. Instead of putting all of our efforts and all of our do dollars into fossil fuels, waiting until we collapse, and then we're going to go into renewables and wind and solar and so on. This is science. Why don't we do it? We're going to run out. Why aren't we looking at the inflection point, the science, and I've got to move along here quickly. Why don't we think differently? Inform demate. Look at science. Look at total cost accounting. Assess our personal values. What's the equity? We only have one Earth for a while. About 10 billion out there. Does IPAT make sense? We can't do anything, we can't have anything without energy. Science is essential. Hypotheses, theories, laws, values, shared values, making policy. We have to talk about three R's. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one R. Reduce. As soon as you reuse and recycle, you're using energy. If you reduce, you're not using anything. Thermodynamics. And TerraWeb. <laughs> We'd be wise to mimic nature. Nature is not wired in, in, in linearly. Nature is, is wired uh, in essentially in parallel. We have not been successful at repealing nature's laws. A lot of skeptics think we can. A lot of denialists say we can. I don't think we can, but of course that's only my point of view. Diversity is essential, okay? And that's why nature is so successful. Humans are self-centered, self but they were also egalitarian. We're confused. And we're always struggling for a balance. Human response, challenge and hope, ingenuity. We can do anything. I'm optimistic. Challenge and despair, yeah, we can do something too. War, destruction, violence. And I believe today's concerns result from yesterday's actions, which require tomorrow's thinking. All of us. Sincere thanks, and I mean it, to my TerraWeb colleagues, <clears throat> to all the people that have participated in the seminar series, which I'm very happy to have been involved in. 
to all those students that have suffered through all these years, starting with Suzanne, even before her. And <clears throat> I, I said I serve finally to my intelligent soul's enduring ramblings of a vociferous egghead. <laughs> I hope we think differently, and I am an optimist. I'll answer any questions. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm very grateful, but I was smiling at my prompter. I don't know what I'd do without these terrible people. I'll try to, I said I'll answer any questions. I won't answer them. I'll try to answer them. No questions. Everybody's happy. That's great. Tony. It's very interesting. Yesterday I had the uh, privilege of listening to Tom Pedersen, who runs a very uh, famous institute uh, across the water at UVic. He was asked at the end of the uh, seminar, I don't know whether anybody was there. Was anybody there yesterday? No. Incredible. The two of you went in completely opposite directions. He scared us with facts about water, agriculture, and power, which you talked about, and using Texas as an example. And then he said the solution was Site C and a carbon tax. And I think if you've done anything today, you've convinced us the carbon tax, as it currently exists, is not a way of moving forward in any way, shape, or form. And Les, I just want to say I appreciate the words that you've said. It's not a question. It's a compliment. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Tony. <coughs> you have no idea uh, what that means to me because I... <coughs> respect you tremendously. The issue that, that I think comes up, and it's rather interesting because uh, Tom Peterson and I <clears throat> have very similar backgrounds. I used to argue with him that the only difference between he and I, we both chemists with dirty minds. Uh, <laughs> the ratio was different. He had more liquid than solid. I had more solid than liquid. <laughs> he, was an, he was an oceanographer. <laughs> Tony, I, I think, that, you know, my opinion on this, and this is an opinion, is that, and I mentioned we all cherry pick, I'm very concerned because what's happened is we've had scientists going out and saying all of these things by cherry picking. And I, I admit I cherry pick because I can't comprehend everything. But it's interesting now, it's the economists, the resource economists and the sociologists that are now coming and questioning our science and our interpretation. Which I, you'd have asked me 10 years ago, I would never have believed it. But you know, Nancy Olleweiler at, at SFU, she's a fantastic holistic econ economist. We rarely hear about her. She doesn't appear in the Vancouver Sun, okay? But she's a solid scientist. And, and Richard York, at the, as a sociologist at the University of Oregon, <clears throat> I met him a couple of years ago and they were gonna make a mistake and invite me to go there. Uh, he's a fantastic sociologist and looking at these particular things and I was surprised Somehow he found out I was giving this presentation and he phoned me this morning and gave me some more information in relation to this stuff. So, you know, it's the sociologists and, and the economists that are bringing the human aspect rather than saying, uh, well, we'll put on a carbon tax, we'll fix this, we'll fix that. Uh, I've had, and I, when I put on these, these people that have to listen to my <coughs> vociferous exp uh, explanations or exposés, the issue that really bothers me is the fact that there's a lot of these things that are indicators of what things are wrong. And that's great. It's fantastic to know that they're indicators and we can visualize those indicators. But for heaven's sakes, let's use them as indicators and try to go back, use our science collectively, and try to find out what's causing these things. And what can we do immediately and what can we do in the longer term? And that's why I have so much faith in, uh, not only Tarawa, but I have so much faith in the University Ac Academy as long as we stick to that important, credible science and then we come along with things like Tarawa, where we're going to get our students to give tomorrow's thinking and communicate that. I'm sorry to profes uh, prof professorialate, but that's 
why I fail. John Pan, Stuart. Um, you try to create a, a pretty substantial linkage between a lot of different bits of the issue, which is a, a real big challenge in a, in a world that really becomes more and more specialized and cries out for interdisciplinarity. And this is, of course, what I think Tara was trying to do, which is interdisciplinary communication. So to try to connect, say, physical science with carbon tax, how does one do that in a logical way to actually advance the dialogue around a carbon tax and make it more mature so that rather than throw out the whole thing, you pick it apart, you analyze it from both the science and the economics and the values perspective and actually try to make something like that work better. You know, if we're going to have a policy instrument, or rather a whole basket of policy instruments, because it isn't just going to be a tax, the whole have to be a whole bunch of things, some of which you haven't thought of yet. How can science enable and inform that so that that conversation is different from the one that occurred when Stefan Dion was defeated in the election? Well, I'll try to answer that, Stuart, because that's a very, <coughs> uh, very important and philosophical. Oh, sorry, Julia. The question was, uh, how do we make those linkages and get the scientists to actually communicate that in these very complicated issues about the carbon tax and how we can possibly either dismantle the carbon tax or make it achieve the kinds of goals we want it to? Is that a reasonable uh, synopsis? Well, among other, among other yeah. things, the, the, the tax is just one problem. No. Back. Yes. Wonder, what bothers me about that? Uh, about what we do in this particular area is the fact that we have a few vociferous people that are more vociferous or more uh, influential and more intelligent than I am that make these particular prognostications and before we even debate it, it's put into policy. And that's my concern. We don't, we miss that communication link in terms of getting to policy and we're so lucky to live in a democracy, we have the opportunity to do this in contrast to a dictatorship. Uh, I was horrified the, the other day when I found out in the same blog that we're going to increase our uh, gateway project by $700 million, create 17,000 jobs, take 200 air, acres out of the agricultural land reserve, you know, blah, 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 because we're going to create 17,000 uh, new jobs. At the same time, we have the auto, auto show in, in Vancouver with these fancy automobiles, and you can buy, I think you should, we all should go out and buy one of these Mercedes. They're only $230,000. And you can plug them in, and you can drive from here to Saskatoon for five bucks. And all of a sudden, the, the province says, what we're gonna do now is we're going to put in a thousand electrical recharge stations in the province so that you can plug your car in free We'll give you $5,000, and we do that without even thinking about the sciences. So there's something wrong, and there's, a, this, there's a disconnect. But because people shout loud, they shout often, and there's, a, there's also an archaeological and an anthropological paradigm for that, they get heard, and we do it. Okay, why? Because if I can afford a 200, no, no, let me just back off. I'll, I'll, I'll let the car people alone. I have a friend of mine who's a golfer. He's an expensive lawyer. He says, fortunately, in the golf courses, we don't have to worry about water tax because we pay our taxes. We can use as much water as we want. We don't have to ration. Okay? There's, there's a disconnect, institutional. And many, many years ago, <coughs> we had a, friend, a, a faculty member by the name of Irving Fox. And one of the things he, he I'll never, I, I forget most things, but one of the things he said was, our biggest problem today is our institutions are ineffective. What are we seeing now? It's the economists, the holistic economists, not the neoclassical economists, the holistic economists, the Rashid Samalias of this world, and you saw what he came out the other day. Most people didn't even see it, but he's concerned about the three trillion dollar potential disaster we're gonna face in the oceans, okay? Here's a guy that can, you know, um, uh, advise the international community. Nobody listens to him. Okay. My golfer friend, oh, we don't have to worry. You know, it's a small peanuts. And these are the kind of issues. Our institutions are failing us. And if we sit back 
as scientists and don't communicate. And then we have to have so holistic economists, thank God they're coming around, and sociologists that are looking at these issues of equity, and we listen to them just as well and put it into the formula as we listen to these physical scientists. I'm optimistic we can do better. And that's why I think Tara Webb and, and everything, everything that graduate students do and so on in the communication is absolutely fantastic, and that's why I'm optimistic. I'm not a pessimist, by the way. Sometimes I'm a real, well, I miss you, Tony. <laughs> could I ask a question, Les, but in doing so, could I ask you to flip back to your summary slide, if you're able to do that? So, so I think the challenge you left us with was the facts, knowledge, values. And, and what I'm going to put is that the values are driven by opinions, all right? And the, what we do is we embrace a, a broader thought. But there are scientific facts. And I think that the, the power to me and the challenge to every scientist in this room is to communicate facts in a way in which the rest of society can understand Everybody will walk away from this talk understanding that its clouds are possibly more important than CO2. And you made that simple point very effectively. And I think, and you started nodding your head, and the question is, do you think that it's the scientist's problem that we're not communicating effectively to the larger public? Yeah, absolutely. Now let me give you an opinion on that. No, I, you're absolutely right. Oh, sorry, Julia. The question was, did you get it? Oh, okay. You see, this, this, is how, this is what I have to live with constantly. It doesn't matter what I do. It's wrong. But I love you, Julia, anyway. I cherry-picked here because there's not much we can do about water vapor, but there's a hell of a lot we can do about CO2. So we should focus on CO2. We can't focus on water vapor. It's not going to do us much good. We have to focus on CO2. We have to focus on methane, and we have to focus on nitrous oxide. There's no question about it. The issue that comes up is let's not blow this out of proportion and make sure that when we present our material, we're aware of these kinds of things. Because it goes back to what can we affect? Okay, what can we affect now? And no, not doing something is doing something. You decided not to do it. I, I use this expression, and we've probably discussed this before. <clears throat> we cannot prove unequivocally that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. We cannot prove it. However, the weight of evidence says, even though it's a small amount, don't smoke, right? So it doesn't matter if we can prove it unequivocally. The important thing is the weight of evidence says. So we don't have to prove that carbon dioxide is the culprit, the only culprit. What we can say is, let's cut it down. And maybe smoking 75 cigarettes an hour versus one cigarette a week <laughs> might make a difference. OK, I'm being silly, but I think you can get the idea. And so this is, we, we're not smart. We, we think we're smart. As homo sapiens, we're not that smart. But at the same time, we get the weight of evidence. We get sharp paradigms. We can get our values. And there's a whole pile of reasons we shouldn't smoke, besides the fact that I might get lung cancer. It stinks up everything and makes all kinds of nasty things and so on. You know. However, if we don't express those particular values, then we will stop tobacco and cigarette selling in Canada and export it all to the developing world and let the people in the developing world smoke all the one, all they can, and all of our Marlboro and everything goes now to, <clears throat> to the developing world. To me, that's not equitable. But again, I'm not very bright. Yes? This might be a question for Tarawa. General, but do you invite particular politicians or policymakers to tune in to these? No, I don't invite anybody to anything. I, uh, a couple of years ago, before the last uh, f um, federal election, a provincial election, I was asked to go to a round table downtown <clears throat> talking about the carbon tax. 
and we had a bunch of people from UBC and everywhere else. The only person that agreed with me on the panel was the, <coughs> was the Green uh, Party member. The liberals are all in favor of it, conservatives are all in favor of it, everybody at UBC, that one, there's three other people from UBC, all in favor of the carbon tax. Only the representative from the Green Party and myself were, I've never been invited back. <laughs> I thought it's a good reason. No, I, know, I don't invite anybody. Well, then all I want to do is I want to wish you all a happy Easter and a happy Passover. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in September. Thank you, Suzanne.